We're going to move on now um, and talk about uh, the relapse and refractory patients. So who's the highest risk for, for um, relapsing, or do we know that, Matt? Or do we only know it after it happens? I, I, I truly, looking into the patient's eyes and trying to figure out, are you going to be one of that 20%? Are you going to be in the 80%? And I think only you know it at, at, uh, at the end of induction, how they do with the response. And then, um, you know, based upon some of the data that's coming out, I, it has influenced me to potentially look either at the end of maintenance uh, therapy to say that that's the completion of treatment number one or at a, at a two-year endpoint from their diagnosis or roughly around, around there to see if I can capture those, that early progressing disease. I think the M7 Flippy even called out that, they, that the M7 Flippy couldn't really uh, look at that, uh, the pod 24, those people who are progressing within 24 months. So, you know, in all comers, it's hard for me to predict. Um, it's often why you kind of try to have the conversation, well, maybe if you can try and shrink that uh, population down, um, only in hindsight, that will inform what you do in, in, in the future. But do we really have data, right? This pod 24, the early progressors do, you know, there is this notion that if I give people therapy uh, and I can shrink that, um, that population, then I'm gonna improve survival for people. But do we really know that? I mean, I mean, you know, that goes back to giving people very, very, if you gave them a bone marrow transplant the front line, you could improve pod tw 24, but you're probably not gonna improve overall survival for, for patients. John, so how do you, you know, I mean, talk, talk to us about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you know, I'm not even nearly as convinced that there is such a thing as progression of disease in less than 24 months that is follicular lymphoma. Um, I think a lot of these people probably have an underlying malignant clone that's much more aggressive that we just haven't seen and it emerges early. Uh, and uh, if we had known about that, we would have been able to treat them perhaps differently up front than wait for them to relapse within the first two years. But it's clear that if you relapse early, you do worse than if you relapse late. There's no question about that, and we worry about those people. Um, you know, who's the highest risk then? I guess we've talked about this. I guess I definitely worry more about the grade threes, uh, and I worry about that person that came into um, into treatment with just an unusual situation where you've got that high SUV value that doesn't exactly fit, or somebody has you know just really an extensive amount of disease, or in particular, I worry about extranodal disease, especially in osseous involvement or other unusual sites of disease. Those are the people that I'm very, very worried about uh, risk of relapse, and I'm gonna pay closer attention to those patients. But I don't think we can stray away from, if we're going to apply the POD24, and it's been applied in informed clinical trials uh, right now, you can't stray away from the original population that was studied and start to apply it to everybody with follicular lymphoma. It was, had to be treated with RCHOP, needed therapy within six months of, of diagnosis. Uh, and it, you know, um, it, was a, it was a good publication, but we have to, you know, the data needs to be encapsulated where those right. patients and were. I think those People that might have done a little worse, again, were probably people that had some underlying uh, transformed clone that we just hadn't seen yet. And this is the concept of POD. It's not, it's not specific for follicular lymphoma. It's also for Hodgkin lymphoma, for diffuse abyssal lymphoma. If you have, if you have a, an early relapse, uh, it could be a really bad situation, but not only for follicular lymphoma. So uh, the real problem that we don't know uh, is it possible so far to stratify the patient according to real high risk in terms of pathobiological data or other data? So you have only the PET evaluation at the end of the treatment and, and some particular extranodal uh, presentation, but it's so difficult uh, on the basis of this uh, aspect uh, to, to change the treatment at the, at the beginning uh, of the story. Maybe the real take-home message from that paper was that there's a group of people with follicular lymphoma that are going to do well, and 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 that's great. We still don't know how to treat the, uh, perhaps how to change things for the uh, for the other group of patients. I have a question for all of you. So, do you think it's a real incurable disease, follicular lymphoma? Because at the end of the day, in uh, all our uh, patient series, there are some patients in continuous complete response after conventional chemotherapy after more than seven, eight, ten years. So is a small subset of patients, but at the end of the day, if you have a patient in continuous complete response after more than seven, eight years, potentially you can call this patient cured. 
Well, uh, we all have a patient that uh, we you know, can think of, uh, and I'm sure the audience does too, where you treated their follicular lymphoma and they never relapse. It, it does happen. Unfortunately, it's pretty uncommon, right?